This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Hello and welcome to 1865, the Nottingham Forest podcast and our match report from Forest defeat on the South Coast as they lost away 1-0 at Brighton and Hove Albion. It was a game that I suppose many supporters were hopeful for given Brighton's recent struggles in Europe and in the Premier League and with Forest's positive display against Liverpool but in the end it was a very underwhelming game from a Forest perspective. They didn't really impose themselves onto the game and conceded midway through the first half after a controversial free kick was awarded. We'll get onto that later. And Pascal Gross's delivery went off Matt Sells he failed to punch it and it deflected in off Andrew Ogbamadeli. Forrest couldn't respond despite some decent chances and lost the game 1-0. And we're recording on Sunday night. I'm your host, George. I've just got back in from the Amex Stadium and I'm joined uh, by Adam for this one. How are you, Adam? Uh, it's frustrating, isn't it? I mean, again, like you mentioned, after the, the good performance against Liverpool, you want, you want to build on that. You know, Brighton were in Europe on Thursday night. You, you maybe thought they'd be tired legs out there and you could take advantage of that. So it, it's just bitterly disappointing, isn't it, again? Yeah, it, it's not brilliant. Um, we'll drive straight in then and we'll look at the team news because that was a big talking point about the game and something that really affected how Forest played. They made a couple of changes from the Liverpool defeat. Danilo and Chris Wood came in uh, and Hudson Odoi and Langer were replaced. So Matt Sells played in goal. There was a back four of Nico Williams, Andrew Omobamadeli, Murillo and Harry Toffolo, Danilo and Ryan Yates in midfield with Dominguez and Origi on the wings, Gibbs White in behind Chris Wood up front, Turner Sangare, Puyate, Awanyu, Hudson Adoy, Felipe, Niakate, Ilanga and Bolly on the bench. Now, that came through and I was absolutely baffled, to be honest, about the team news. Brighton coming off being defeated in Europe in midweek and you're thinking, that, you know, they're going to make changes, but they'll have tired legs. Forrest can play Ilanga, play... Hudson Adoy and get at them, get at them with pace. But there was no pace in the side at all from from Nuno from the start. Williams was our only attacking threat really down the right and Toffolo down the left. And it was Adam playing Dominguez on the wing when you don't need to. It was baffling when you saw the team news. I just, I just don't. I, I, I've said this before with the Dominguez thing. I just, I don't see him as a winger. I, I think he's such a talented midfielder. I don't understand because not only are you having. A position out there where you know, you've got Hudson Adore on the bench, you've got Alanga on the bench. You know, it's it's not just that; it's the fact that you've got a player that's more effective in the middle, and it's it's something we talked about just before we started recording. There's this habit of trying to shoehorn players in because they're playing well and putting them into positions that they're not comfortable in. Yeah, if you want to play Dominguez, just play Dominguez and Danilo, or if you want to play a bit, you know, play Dominguez and Yates, or play Dominguez and Sangare. You don't have to shoehorn him in out wide. It's just, it's just, it's confusing. And and I understand it if it's a cohesion thing and it's a, you know, we've played well this way. We've played well with him being out there and the system works better because he plays out there. But it's not been like that at all. And it's just really confusing. Yeah. And, and I get what you're saying because Dominguez playing out of the wing worked when he needed to cover that position. But when you've got two ready-made wingers on the bench, it just does not make sense to play Dominguez there over him, especially when, like like I say, they play a centre-back at right-back. So why not try and exploit that? But we'll stay with the manager and touch on his substitutes uh, throughout the game. So Ilanga and Sangari came on after 60, Hudson and Doida won the after 70, and Koyate uh, for Gibbs White with five to go. That was what frustrated me the most. Taking Forrest were 1-0 down at this point, and they had the most possession that they had throughout the game, obviously with Brighton clinging on and Forrest trying to go for the the equaliser gives White Forest most creative player gets substitute for Cheku Kuyate, who is the opposite. And he's a midfielder, he's a decent player. And I thought the only way he could come on was if Chris Wood was being replaced because maybe he was tired. But Kuyate comes on for Gibbs White Forest most creative player. That was strange. I think Sangare coming on, I can't see. He's a very weird player. Reminds me, and I was talking to my mate on the, the train back of Paul Pogba because he looks like a great footballer. He does these nice passes, but he just goes missing and the game seems to pass him by. So a very strange substitutions throughout from Nuno as well as the selection, Adam. Yeah, and I think that taking 
Gibbs White off being your most creative player for a player that you you look at that sub and you're probably thinking as a fan you probably fought in the ground like why are we it almost looks like we're trying to shore it up to not concede another one rather yeah. than get an equaliser it's this it's this unbelievable amount of respect given to the opponent and I mean for me you you you've got a situation where you've got um, Hudson Odoi and Alanga who look. I don't. I don't think we've had a player this season that's probably been that you can say honestly that's been consistent throughout the whole season. They've been brilliant. You know, I think that every player's had their you know purple patches and you know in and out of the team. But I just think Alanga and Hudson Odoi out wide starting today and to bring them on at that point in the game and it not change anything as well is fairly worrying in itself. But you start with that pace from the start. You catch them on the break. You, you know, you catch a team that, like like we say, have played in Europe on Thursday night. You know, we've had the bigger rest. I just, I, I can't. I, it, it all, it all just seems strange to me. I, I'm still trying to figure it out. And I mean, Sangari is a really weird one because when we signed him, obviously, you know, I was absolutely buzzing. I, you yeah. know, I was so excited. I didn't think we'd get him. I thought he would. I thought he'd go to a team that's probably already in the top ten established and. I was so happy to get him, and it just hasn't really worked so far. And I don't, I don't, it's not, I don't think it's all his fault. I think, you know, he was, he had a difficult start when he came in. Then we had AFCON, then, a man, then the manager changed, and he's come back from AFCON with an injury. It's, it's been hard for him to kind of get that really good run in the team. But it, it's just, yeah, it, it's weird. It is, it's so strange. And I, I do feel like he will come good. And I feel like, I, I would like to say that Dominguez and, you know, Sangare is probably our strongest DM partnership in that 4-2-3-1, but I don't think it is at the minute. I think it's probably, you're probably looking at Dominguez and Danilo at, uh, at the minute, and I think that's probably just where we're at. And it's, I don't know. It's it's just so, it's just, to, to bring this very long point back to the team, it's so confusing, and the confusion then turns to frustration with the fan base, and I think that's where we're at. And just lastly on Nuno, and you touched on the fan base there, there doesn't really seem to be a bond between the manager and the fans at the minute because under Steve Cooper, we know, and throughout me going to Forest away games over the past, I've been going for, what, seven, eight years in away ends, every single manager has had their name in a chant pretty much straight away. Even, uh, I remember an away game against Reading when between managers and we had Simon Island as an interim manager and we were singing his name, yeah. I can't remember hearing one Nuno chant from the fans. And it's always going to be hard following a cult hero like Steve Cooper. And he was probably never going to replicate the love between the fans that Cooper had. But do you think that Forrest need to stay up for Nuno to gain that love? Because it's just not there at the minute. Do you know what I don't understand about Nuno? I think this is probably the strangest thing. You know, with Wolves, he did have such an affiliation to the fans. I mean, like, they absolutely loved him. They used to win a game. He used to go over, you know, to the fans and give it large, and you know all this sort of stuff. And it's like it almost seems, and maybe I'm being a bit harsh on Nuno here, but it almost seems like I don't know if he has tried hard enough to maybe have that bond with the fans. I think it goes both ways. I'm surprised that the fans haven't made a chant or started something, but I, I don't think the fans are completely convinced on Nuno. And I think that for me, he. He has improved the way we've played football. Absolutely, that like we're playing a you know a better brand of football. We look gem- generally better in games, but that has to translate to results. And when it's not translating to results, and I, we have been so unlucky, but unfortunately, unlucky doesn't cut it in football. Managers lose their jobs even if they're unlucky. And I think if we go down, I don't think he even stays to get the opportunity to bring us back up. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't agree, uh, disagree with that. So we'll steer it back to the Brighton game then. Um, we're going to get Tom's thoughts as he was walking back to the car. I saw him on the way out as I was uh, walking. He was in the the T and or the block next to me, and he didn't look very pleased. So let's hear what he's had to say. Just walking back to the car now, and yet again, it's another defeat on the road for Forest. Um, I think that's a bit on Nuno's team selection was very iffy, and was very passive in the first half. Was poor with the ball, was poor out of possession. Um, Div Okarivi's had a chance in the first half straight at uh, Verbruggen should be doing a lot better than the, the goal what we conceded just the catalogue of errors really Amabama Deli he's a bit in no man's land in terms of what to do when the ball comes in and Matt Sells just flaps at it then basically not a lot happened in the first half then second half we show a bit more urgency and a bit better with the ball but again we're chasing the game 
Um, Divock Origi's had another chance where he's basically um, just blasted the ball into the English Channel. It's pretty awful. Um, he's got to hit the target from there, and it's awful, especially from a Premier League striker. And they just kept us at arm's length, and it seemed that we were the team who's played in midweek and not Brighton, who's been to uh, Rome and back in their Europa League tie against Roma. And um, yeah, we didn't really lay a glove on them second half. It was like a lot of huffing and puffing. Changes did um, make a difference, but yet again, um, we don't lay a glove on uh, yet another team who, in my eyes, were there for the taking. So then the challenge from Moda. Um, on Williams, I think it was. It was a horrific challenge. And how he's not been sent off for that, I will never know. And um, seriously, what's the point of being in this league anymore? Uh, the, the levels of corruption absolutely stink. Obviously, they had the fallout last week. We've had uh, decisions what haven't gone against us uh, pretty much all season. And that it's a high challenge. He's out of control. It's a buff. Um, it, well, he's hit the ankle, his ankle and everything. And it's an, honestly, it's an awful challenge. And, and you just get a yellow card for that. And it just absolutely reeks this um, league of corruption. Um, we made a couple of changes. I mean, Awani come on, Sangari come on, uh, Kiata come on, which was a bit of a strange uh, decision to bring on him on because you've, you've got replaced by um, with Morgan Gibbs White going off. And I, I just think you you lost all creativity then. And Brighton just basically kept us at arm's length. They kept it in the corner for a good couple of minutes and just basically killed the game and everything but um, we'll go again against Luton next week and we've got to be bang at it because at the moment we cannot de- uh, defend set pieces uh, to save our lives and they're going to be bang at it next week in terms of because um, that's one of their strengths especially with Carlton Morris and Arbe Bayo um, etc so um, yeah it's a must win next week Yeah, I think nicely summed up by Tom. I've got to say, me and Adam both didn't listen to that, so we didn't know if uh, we'd have to do some expletives. But luckily, I think that uh, passed the test. But we'll get on to the game and look at the first half then. And Forrest didn't actually start too badly. We looked threatening on the counter. We were always going to, maybe, like we've alluded to, if we had Elanga and uh, Hilton and I on the pitch, we would have done more. But then we started to allow Brighton to settle and that uh, proved fatal, really. They pressured Forrest throughout the early stages and forced Sales into a couple of good saves. Firstly, after 11 minutes, he kept out uh, Beleba, I think. He actually had a really good game for them. And I spoke to a Brighton fan on the bus uh, and the train back about him. He had a really good game. Sales uh, kept him out. And then Moda had a headed chance that was saved by the keeper after about 15 minutes from a free kick. But he couldn't do it all because Forrest conceded, as we've mentioned, on 29 minutes after a free kick. We'll talk about the awarding of the free kick later on in the pod, just after the break. We're going to have a whole section about the uh, refereeing incidents. But on the free kick itself, it was given, swung in by Pascal Gross and Sells's poor attempt of a punch went straight against Andrew R. Bamadeli and into the net. So Adam Sells ought to have done a lot better with that after having a very good start to the game. Yeah, no doubt. I mean... Um, on the uh, extended highlights that I saw, um, he did make some really good saves. And when I was putting down my notes to talk about, um, I put down on my notes to say, oh, Sells made some really good saves. He did really well. And then I saw the goal and I went, <laughs> all right, okay, I probably have to chuck some of them notes out then because uh, he's kind of ruined it a bit now. Yeah, I don't know what he's doing. I mean, I, I mean, I, there's been a lot of people defending him online saying that it's slippery conditions, the ball's wet, all this sort of stuff. I'm not, I'm not having any of that. I'm, I'm, I'm not having that. I mean, punching the ball away, is is basics it's 101 you know if you if you don't feel like you can catch it i understand but that is basic that is absolutely basic that he has to get rid of that somehow if he gets rid of it by punching it he gets rid of it by punching it if he gets rid of it by catching it or you know whatever that's fine but you, you cannot do that and it's it's so so basic and it's so frustrating as well because i think as Forest fans, we've actually endured a lot goalkeeper wise this season, and Sells kind of looked a little bit like he might not be the answer, but he might be the stopgap for at least a little bit. And yeah, it's disappointing. It's really disappointing goal to concede. And goalkeepers, like you said, we thought that we'd buried that hatchet, but it really it's ugly head once again. But another thing you can add, if you listen to the big card, we spoke about it. Um, that referees, goalies, and injuries have all cost Forest the most this season. But I think now. We're starting to add not taking the chances that we've had because we've not now scored in the last three games, but we've had chances in all three of those games to to convert big time. I mean, Divock Origi has two huge chances throughout the 90 minutes. Both of them, uh, Morgan gives what plays him in. In the first half, he turns on halfway, slots him in down the right wing and Origi has loads of time, runs onto it, into the box. And then Verbruggen does well. The angle's closed. 
and Origi hits it straight into the Bruggen's legs. And then he gets a very similar chance in the second half, if not better, running a bit cent- more central. Gibbs White plays him through again. And this time he gets into the box and does the opposite. Instead of low straight at the keeper, he balloons it, as Tom said, basically into the sea. And that's such a poor, poor miss from Divock Origi. And then Forrest's actual best sort of chance they had of the game was actually through Chris Wood. And it wasn't an opportunity that should have been the best chance of the game because Origi's by far were better opportunities. But Wood made a good fist of it. Gibbs White lifted a ball in towards the box in the second half, towards the back post. He went over both centre-backs and his left-footed shot from the left of the box was saved by the goalkeeper. So I hope that you can really blame Chris Wood for not scoring that. But for Divock Origi, he's got to take one of those chances, Adam. Yeah, I mean, the first one, if if he feels the angle's been closed down too much, he could square it. I, I understand yeah. that Dunk was probably there, but the, the right ball across, he squares that. It's a tap in for Wood and it's, it's, you know, it's a goal. It's not an issue. The second one's just, it's just, unf- it's just, un- it's just bad. It's really bad. I, mean, I, I was t- teetering on saying unforgivable, but I mean, it's a bit harsh, but it was, it, he can't be, he, he's got to get it on target at least. I mean, at least the first one, look, it's a poor effort, but he gets it on target. I mean, that, the second one was just, it was a really, really poor effort. And it's a poor effort for a player that doesn't really lack a lot of confidence either. He's not the sort of player that you think, oh, he's just, you know, lacks the confidence. He's not that kind of player. Um, so, yeah, it's just really frustrating. And in a game where, you know, from what I've seen and what I've, you know, heard, understood, whatever, the game was fairly there for the taking if we had yeah. sort, of, sort of gone into that extra gear to sort of, create them more chances. But when you get those chances, you've got to take them. Um, I did com- completely agree with you on the Chris Wood one. Though. I mean, I, it almost, I, I don't want to say half chance, but he almost makes it more of a chance because it's a really, really tight angle. Brilliant ball by Gibbs White, by the way. Um, but yeah, it's a really tight angle. And if he scores that, it's absolutely clinical. You know, if, if he doesn't, you know, you kind of can't expect him to. But yeah, on a day where you don't create much, we talk more about them incidents. Yeah, and just something on you said there. Brighton, I thought, throughout the game were there for the taking. I thought they were poor, particularly second half. I mean, first half, we let them play a bit, but second half, they were they were abysmal. And, and often Forest make teams look better than they are, but we didn't even do that. Brighton didn't actually look anything special. But Forest, I just thought, lacked the intent to to try and push for an equaliser. And I I looked at it and I compared it to Luton yesterday. And in start, they were losing the game at Crystal Palace. But they kept fighting throughout stoppage time and they scored with pretty much the last minute of the game. And that just shows how much they wanted that. Whereas for the most of the injury time for the six minutes that were added on, I believe it was six minutes, Boris, the ball was played in Brighton's half next to their corner flag. And they had one little flurry forward towards the end um, and it didn't come to anything. So it, it, it was never going to come, Adam, the goal or the equaliser. It didn't look like anyway. No, I mean, I, I actually watched the Palace Luton game yesterday, um, and I mean, Luton. Don't get me wrong, Luton were fairly fortunate; it was only one nil. But they they did fight and they did give it right until the end. And look, if you're talking about quality, we're a better team than Luton. I, don't, I have no doubt about that whatsoever. Yeah. But I just think that if they're gonna if they're gonna want it more, I mean, that that has to concern you going into next week's game for sure. Anyway that they might just want it a little bit more. And the strange thing about Nuno since he's come in is that one thing that we're actually good at under Nuno is scoring goals. Yeah. That has been something that we are good at. We are good at scoring goals. And now we've had the United, you know, United, Liverpool and Brighton where we haven't scored a goal. And it's it's almost like he's overcorrected because we were leaking a lot of goals. Maybe he thought, all right, we need to shore up a little bit at the back. And now we've overcorrected and now we can't score. And... Like I say, I think that sometimes you can look at it and say unlucky and against Liverpool, really unlucky against United, fairly unlucky as well. You know, we've had performances where we've gone, you know what, we didn't play that badly, probably deserve some out of that. And today, by the sound of it, that's not the case. And, you know, we'll, we'll come on to the referee later on, but there's only so much you can blame the referee for. You still need to perform um, as well. And if we're not doing that, then that's going to be a serious problem. And you're right, it does seem like either we can't score and con- and don't concede or we score loads but concede loads. We've gone from losing, what was it, 3-2 three to, three to Newcastle, beating West Ham 2-0 and then 4-2 to Villa up to 3 one nils in a row. And how you can go from one to the other, it's quite strange and only things like that could happen at Forest, I guess. But we're going to have a break and then we'll come on to the much-awaited refereeing decisions 
And I think we'll also look ahead to the Luton game at the weekend, which looks very, very important at the moment. The 1865 Match Report. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders, from ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities. CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers. We're pleased to announce that this episode of 1865, the Nottingham Forest podcast, is sponsored by Green King Sport, where football is more than a game. Green King Sport venues are showing every single televised Forest fixture over the 23-24 season. And with more than 900 sports pubs across the UK, it doesn't matter where you're based, you can catch every single minute of the action. If you download the Green King Sport app, you won't just get 10% off all drinks anytime there's a match on the TV, but this month there's also free Guinness to be won and the chance to win one of six holidays. And you'll be supporting us here at 1865, the Nottingham Forest podcast. Now it's back to your podcast. You're listening to 1865, the Nottingham Forest podcast. Hello and welcome back to the 1865 match report from Forest defeat on the South Coast away at Brighton. We've spoke a lot about the performance and about the manager, but now it's time to touch on the refereeing decisions. And I don't think we want to become a moaning club about referees every single week, but it is every single week that we have decisions go against us. Let's just run through some of the appalling decisions that happened in the game today or yesterday as you're listening to it. So, Firstly, I was quick to pick up on that the referee was very eager to book our players throughout the game, yet Brighton's fouls, he wasn't compensated for. It's only Forrest that he was booking. And it, it just didn't seem right, it didn't seem fair, to be fair. Then, for the goal that Brighton scored, I, I was on row two, and I was just in front of the corner of the penalty area. So I was right in, right behind that tackle. Andrew Amabamadeli, he I forgot who it was on, but he slides in, he gets all of the ball that goes out for a throw-in, and then barely touches the defender. He's already on the bucket and I'm surprised the referee didn't send him off, to be fair. But he definitely gets the ball. For me, that's not a foul and I know the referee was the other side of it so it could have looked like a foul. But that, for me, is not a foul. He got the ball. Then there's a, a murmur for offside, I think, for Ansu Fati from the goal, but I'm not too sure about that. And then the big talking point that most people will be talking about for the game, I'm sure Mark Clattenberg will have his say about that in the coming days, is Jakob Moda's challenge on Nico Williams. And he dives in there, as Tom mentioned earlier, two-footed. He goes with the first foot. Then his second foot comes as he makes contact with Williams. And it's a good job Nico didn't have any sort of force on his right foot because that could be a leg breaker. And everybody in the UA end, and I think a lot of the home fans, probably accepted that's a red card. The referee took his yellow card out, then put it back in his pocket and waited for the melee to die down. Then he goes to his pocket and brandishes the yellow card. And then the VAR check comes along, which we all thought, right, he's given the yellow, VAR will send him off then. 90 second check so clearly there's something wrong with it and they don't even send the referee to the monitor I mean I don't think Forrest would have scored now if they were still playing even with the red card but for these decisions every week Adam it's baffling how they can keep getting them wrong yeah I'm just lost for words I mean like you say it it does happen every week and you know the the videos obviously surfaced online and all the comments by Brighton by Brighton fans as well saying no idea no idea oh it's not a red card it's a horrible challenge. You know what? And I put it in my group chat. This this does actually happen a lot when it's this sort of surface. You know when it's been raining? You know when it's like a horrible rainy football game, right? A lot of the time, referees' justification for decisions like this is the conditions. You have to take the conditions into effect. So a slide tackle looks worse in the rain than it does in the dry, right? There, there, there is that. And that's surely going to be the excuse they use. But... I'm really trying to play devil's advocate here and clutch at some straws to try and find some sort of way why it wasn't a red card. And I just can't really. It's it's as clear as day as red. And if the ref doesn't see it, or if the ref doesn't get a clear view of it and he thinks it's a yellow, fine. That's why we have VAR. If it wasn't checked at all, we'd be annoyed. But I think I'm more annoyed that it was checked because 90 seconds go by and they get every single angle of it. They get it in slow motion, all that sort of stuff. And they, by doing that, they have said conclusively, we believe 
that is not a red card. That That's what they've said. Concl- that is not a red card. End of story, not a red card. It's how can you... I don't know how you can come to that summary. I, I, I Honestly, it's embarrassing. And it's week after week after week. And we've had apology after apology. And I'm no doubt we'll get another one. Yeah. But they mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. Uh, I've just got the fixtures up here. So you look at Forest last few games. We've got the Newcastle game that we should have had a penalty for on a one year. Then the West Ham game that we should have had a penalty on Williams. Obviously, we won that game. Villa, I don't think there was any controversial decisions, but Manchester United, we had the free kick that was pretty much a carbon copy of the Liverpool goal that was chalked out. And then we had Liverpool last week. We don't need to comment on that. And then this today. And it is every single week. And I don't know what Mark Clattenburg's role in this is. And we saw a very different reaction to um, the incidents this time from Nuno and Gibbs White. Both of them have came out after the match pretty firm on their sort of slander on the PGMO, where last week Nuno wouldn't comment, refused to comment, and in the pre-match he did. But it looks like this has really got to Forest's head, and rightly so, because it's a repeated incident that keeps happening, Adam. So what did you make of what was said after the game? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's kind of funny because I think Clattenburg was actually brought in to be the ambassador for the club to come out and say stuff because he can, whereas players and management can't really. So I think that's actually what Clattenburg's role is. Um, I mean, we could go back even further with some of the decisions, by the way. The Bournemouth game, there was two. Never a red card, definitely a penalty. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it, And that's where it gets frustrating. I don't blame Nuno or Morgan Gibbs-White for coming out after the game and getting angry. You know, Morgan saying it's getting ridiculous, it's every week and all that sort of stuff. And Nuno saying we don't want any apologies. You know, we don't want that. We just want... and. I think that players and managers should be able to come out and say this sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, um, but unfortunately, when you've got a referee, uh, what's he called, a referee liaison officer or whatever you want to call him, right? When you've got him in the building, maybe just say to, when they ask you a question, just 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 say no comment and let him deal with it. I don't actually know what Clattenburg can do, and I don't think he can do anything in the sense that nobody can do anything. The decision is made, the decision's done, it's, it is what it is. But... We can't afford, as as much as I'm frustrated, as you're frustrated, the players, management, anyone involved around the club's frustrated, we can't have this be an excuse for performances. We have played well, and the games have played well that it's cost us, fair enough. Today, from obviously what I've seen, what you know, whatever, the performance wasn't good enough either. But you would have yeah. liked the opportunity with not, with 10 men for 25 minutes, wouldn't you? You would have liked the opportunity at the very least. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right, Adam. And Forrest have had apology after apology from the Premier League, and I think they've just given up, and rightly so, because what do apologies change? They acknowledge that the decisions are wrong, but you're not going to get anything out of it. And we don't want to go down the narrative of saying that there's a bias, that the Premier League's corrupt, but there were chants in the away end about the Premier League being corrupt. And it's hard to disagree with that at the minute, because, like I mentioned the games earlier, the constant things that go against Forrest, it's getting out of hand and absolutely ridiculous now. And Nuno and Gibbs White, like you said, we shouldn't have came out and said and with the raw reaction that they did. But Clattenburg can give his sort of media trained answer. But Forrest just need it to be right. And they're just going to do everything they can to try and get things to go into in their favour. And not even that, just for the right decision to be made, because it's outlandish and it's clear what's going against Forrest. And it's like the whole stadium can see what's wrong with it. But the middle man in the middle can't. It just baffles me sometimes. But yeah, I think we've spoken enough about that. So we'll we'll skirt away from the referees and just touch on the game finally because it was a very flat game and a very flat atmosphere actually around the Amex. And Forrest could have pounced on that, should have pounced on that and just absolutely didn't. So I'm not really sure what the answer was to that game. But we'll move on and look ahead to Kenilworth Road next week because that just looks like a playoff final, Adam, doesn't it? Forrest to 17th uh, with 24 points. Just three ahead of Luton in 18th. And it is almost like a, a promotion playoff, although it's the other way around because whoever loses is, is very likely to get relegated. So how, how do you see Forrest coming through that and trying to um, get, a, get a point or a result? I mean, I, I want to be positive. I want to say that we've got enough quality to go there and beat Luton, but I, I don't know at the minute. And I think the reason I don't know is because they've just got a bit more fight in them. Yeah, they just yeah. seem to want it a bit more than we do. And 
you know, Kenilworth Road's not the easiest place to go. And, you know, they've made, they've not made it a fortress. I think, I think matches, hell, some, someone saying last week they made it a bit of a fortress. I think it's a bit over the top, but yeah. they are, they are playing well at home. And I think they are playing better at home. And we've, I mean, that's, it is a, as much of a must win as must win is because you look at it this way, right? We're three points above Luton at the minute. They've got a game in hand. And we could potentially, from what you read, get a three-point deduction. It seems like if we get a deduction, it'd probably be three points. So they win their game in hand and we get beat by them. That puts us in a very, very perilous situation. So we have got to win. It's, it's not It's not a, oh, we need to avoid defeat to stop them winning. No, no, no. It's a, we need to win this game of football next week. There is no if, buts and maybes about it. We've got to win. And I've just got to hope that we can pull a performance out like we did against someone like West Ham or like we did against Liverpool or like we did against Man U, but against a worse side and hope we can pull a performance like that out. But I, I don't know. And, I, and I'm, I'm hoping more than I am anything else. And I'm looking about how to approach it as well, because Forrest could go one or two ways. They could play sort of Yates in midfield to grit and determination and, and win the ball back and Marshall at the back four, Bolly at the back maybe to come in and head some corners away because we know how much of a threat they are from set pieces and Forrest are awful at that the set piece coaches on gardening leave although I don't know what he really did anyway or Forrest can maybe approach it how they did at Brighton playing ball playing players like Danilo Dominguez maybe hopefully putting Ilanga and Hudson Odoi back in the side just to add a bit of threat and then up front I think I'd stick with Chris Wood because I think he looks like our most informed our most confident striker at the minute and like I mentioned earlier, I think he is the only player that could come out of the Brighton game with any sort of credibility because from minute one, we had, we had kickoff, we played it up there and Wood won a header and you could see his presence that we've been missing because Tyrus came back, but if we're being honest, hasn't really looked fit and looked look sharp enough to start. And and then, I don't know what the other alternative is, but later on in the game, Wood was sprinting down on the 85th minute and closing players down. And after not playing for six Six weeks, is it something like that? He's been out to come in and play pretty much the whole game. I was very impressed by him. So how would you approach the game, Adam? I think I'd probably keep Wood in. Um, you know, before his injury, he was absolutely essential for us. I probably would keep Wood in, but I would surround that with hudson Adoy on one side, Langer on the other side, and I'd probably go for... Against Luton, I'd probably go for Danilo and Dominguez. I think that probably gives you the best balance in midfield. Um, and I think defensively, I think it, it sort of picks itself a little bit. I think mean, Nico Williams has to start. He's been one of our best players recently. Um, left back, I'd still go tough for me. Um, yes. I think the centre back, the centre back one's more interesting discussion, isn't it? Because I think Ahmed Bandelli got back in the team today, and I really like him. I think he's been fantastic when he's played, but I felt a bit harsh on Felipe. If Felipe's yeah. fully fit, I maybe would have, I maybe would have gone with Felipe um, today. I probably would definitely go with him against Luton. I think it's his type of game. Um, and then obviously Matt sells in goals again. But I think the way we've got to approach the game is we've got to try and score score goals early. You know, get go what get one a lot, get two and a lot, make them come at us, let us catch them on the break again. I think that's the that's the key in that game. But what we can't do and what we can't afford to do is give them any respect whatsoever, because we are a better team than them and we have to emphasize that. Yeah, and, and I think everyone hates the cliche six pointer, but it does seem very, very relevant. And you're going to make sure that you'll be able to watch that, Adam, and uh, not have any Mother's Day plans, yeah? Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, I, I woke up this morning, uh, yesterday and I was like, oh, yeah, you know, if you watch the Forest game tomorrow, you know, and, you know, happy days, sorted, whatever. And then it's like, oh, you know, it's Mother's Day. I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, no, no worries, that's fine. I'll go, you know. I, I spent the day with my mum and all that sort of stuff. But no, next Saturday I will, I will, I will be watching. Um, unfortunately, couldn't get tickets, but I think we all knew that Luton away was going to be the lottery. Um, I went when Sammy Sammy Amiobi scored the other year. Yeah, uh, it's it's definitely it. it's it's an experience of a ground. If you've not been and it is your first time going this year, uh, enjoy it. It's a proper old school football ground. Thanks, Adam. It will be my first time, so. Uh... Yeah, hopefully I'll enjoy it. Yeah, and luckily I, I go to football with my grandma, so that was my excuse for Mother's Day football. But I think we'll leave it there. Thank you for joining me, Adam. And uh, thank you, listener. Make sure you follow 1865 on all the social media. If you go to the words 1865.football, you'll find all the links there. 
We'll be back with the Friday Five uh, later on in the week and hopefully a more positive match report next week after the Luton game. But until then, have a great week and it's goodbye for us. And I got back at 3 a.m. like last night. Just needed a performance today. It didn't bloody happen. Sports Social Podcast Network.